Hello! Today we are starting a series of videos about 3D reconstructions because that's a topic that I found fascinating for a long time and over the past few years I tried it a few times with different objects that I liked but the results were never as good as I'd hoped. I think the main reason is that I didn't really know what I was doing. So in this series of videos I'm going to do some, th some 3D reconstructions and I want to test a few methods that should have an impact on the quality of those reconstructions. And I want to see just how good of a result we can get. In case you're not familiar with the topic, we're going to take a lot of photos of an object that we're interested in, and then we'll use some software to create a 3D model based on these photos. So we're taking photos, not LiDAR measurements or anything else. Um, just to give you an idea, first, we'll look at some of the more basic things, such as the number of images, the resolution and sharpness, aperture, ISO, lighting, and so on. And then we'll look at some methods that could potentially give us much better results, especially for objects that are difficult to scan because of their surface structure. So I'll be using the open source program Meshroom. And Meshroom uses a method called photogrammetry to reconstruct the images. But the focus of these videos is really on how to take good pictures. And that should be the same, or at least very similar, if you use different methods, such as Nerf or Gaussian splatting, or if you use a different program, like one of those apps for your phone. Of course, since I'm using Meshroom, some of the things that I'll be doing are specific to Meshroom. So, for this series of videos, I'll be focusing on reconstructing smallish objects, maybe up to a meter in the largest direction. And I'll be doing it indoors, where we potentially have full control over the entire process. So, at least for now, I'm not reconstructing landscapes or large buildings, but smaller objects. Okay, that's been a very brief overview of the project. But before we can start testing methods, we have to think about how to take the pictures that we'll use for the reconstruction. So for the most part of this video, we'll talk about image acquisition. And at the end, we'll do a brief test of one of the methods that could help with reconstructing difficult objects. So back to image acquisition. Of course, we could take the images manually, as we do here, but that's really time consuming. This one took about 10 minutes for 72 photos. And it may be fun the first time you do it, but it gets boring really quickly. And since I'll be doing quite a lot of tests, I need something that requires as little manual involvement as possible. Also, when you do the reconstruction, you see that the positions from where I took those pictures are not spaced very evenly. That wasn't an issue in this particular case, but in some other tests that I did, if the gap between images was too large, then the algorithm wasn't able to connect adjacent images and the reconstruction failed. So from this very manual process, I got this reconstruction here. And at first glance, we notice a few things. The first is that the object that we are interested in is connected to its surroundings, to this piece of wood underneath it. Ideally, we just want a model of the object and we'll try to fix that in one of the future videos. Next, you notice that I put some additional objects around the piece of wood and that made it easier for the algorithm to find the position of each of the cameras. I did that here because the object itself looks pretty much the same when you look at it from the left and from the right. And without these additional objects, the algorithm got a bit confused and it wasn't able to easily determine which photos should be in front and which in the back. Next, you notice that the brightness of the object is not the same in the front and in the back. And that's because, as you saw in the video, I didn't do anything with respect to lighting the object. The side facing the window is brighter and the side facing the wall is darker. And of course, lighting is something we'll look at in a future video. So from a bit further away, this reconstruction doesn't look too bad. But when we zoom in, then we see quite a few issues. There are some parts of the object where the reconstruction didn't work at all. I think that may have been because of my bad lighting, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I didn't look into it because this manual process is way too tedious anyway, and this doesn't happen with how I normally do it. Next, 
I want to try a faster way of doing this manually. So I set up a rotating chair to be a manual version of a turntable. And that was a lot faster. It, it took about five minutes to take 92 pictures. But this time, my additional objects didn't really help and Meshroom did not find all camera positions correctly. You can see this gap in the back of the object. Meshroom placed the cameras that should be on this side in the front. And that is something that you can usually fix. For example, in this case, I initially removed the images that were placed wrong and I did a reconstruction with only those images that were found correctly. And then I locked that reconstruction and augmented it with pictures um, with the pictures that, that I didn't include before. And then Meshroom found the locations of those images correctly. So this works and the images are certainly spread out more consistently than before. That's the result that I got from this reconstruction, which is not too bad. The mesh is still not clean around these holes here, but overall the quality is not too bad. Okay, another way of potentially speeding up the process is by taking a video extracting some frames from it and using those for the reconstruction. That is certainly faster. It only took about one and a half minutes and I got 178 keyframes out of it. But there are a few drawbacks. First, for most cameras, the resolution of videos is quite a bit worse than the resolution of still photos, which could be an issue. Another issue is that with videos, our shutter speed is quite restricted. Since returning the object, we need the shutter speed to be fast enough to avoid motion blur. But a faster shutter speed means that less light comes into the lens. So we need to compensate by opening the lens wider, by increasing the ISO, or by providing a lot more light. We haven't yet talked about which aperture to use. And for the tests in this video, I used from somewhere between f8 to f11 to make sure that the object is relatively sharp from front to back. In a future video, we'll try to use the lens at its sharpest aperture, which for my lenses is usually around f5.6. That leads to a depth of field that's more narrow than at f8. And so we'll need to do some focus stacking to get an image where the entire object is sharp. But whatever we do, our f number will probably be large. So the lens won't let in much light. So to compensate for the faster shutter speed of the video, we can only increase the ISO or provide more light. And I think unless you've got a very good setup, providing enough light can be tricky. So most probably our video won't use the minimum ISO, but something larger. Uh, for example, in the video that I took here, the ISO was between 2000 and 2500. And that was using daylight, which is relatively bright. If I did this in the evening with just artificial light, then I'd need a very bright setup. So I think if you've got a camera that can take high resolution videos and you can provide enough light, then extracting frames from a video may be an option. When I did the reconstruction with the frames extracted from the video, Meshroom again wasn't able to find all camera locations correctly. But just like before, doing a partial reconstruction and augmenting it worked fine. And the reconstruction itself is not too bad, but you can definitely see a difference to the reconstruction of the higher resolution still images, which we did before. I think it's most visible at the grooves in the corners of the object. In the previous reconstruction, the grooves were quite deep and now they're not. Now everything is, is more smoothed out. So I do want the better resolution of the still photos. And I don't really want to spend a lot of time on creating a very bright lighting setup. So I'm not going to use frames extracted from a video, but I'll be using photos. Okay, so far we've done everything manually. That's going to change now. So the first thing I built was this little turntable, which is connected to an Arduino. And both the Arduino and my camera are connected to a computer. And the computer tells the Arduino when to move the stepper motor and the computer tells the camera when to take a picture. And the computer immediately downloads the pictures from the camera. Um, there will be a separate video about building this turntable and there I'll go into a lot more details. So this setup already requires a lot less manual intervention when taking photos. The only thing I have to do is to change the height of the tripod. 
Unfortunately, uh, this time Meshroom really struggled with finding the camera positions correctly. And even partial reconstructions didn't really work, because he kept finding features in the background which seemed to distract it. And I think the wall in the background may give rise to a lot of false uh, matches. So to get this to reconstruct, I had to manually create four masks to tell Meshroom which parts of the image to ignore and which to use. That's something I really don't want to do, because it's tedious and it takes quite a bit of time. Uh, the reconstruction itself is quite good though. Okay, I think we've spent enough time playing around. Uh, let's do this properly now. The second machine I built is this one. You can connect the turntable to it and you can screw the camera in place and it can move closer to or further away from the object. The machine can move the camera up and down and it can rotate the camera. To set everything up, I use a gamepad and when I press start, then the machine takes pictures in regular intervals on a kind of half sphere. So apart from the initial setup, I don't have to do anything. Um, well, anything manually. <laughs> I can set up the machine and do something else in the meantime while it's taking pictures. Uh, there will be a video about building this machine. So let's look at the reconstruction. First of all, look at how evenly the cameras are spaced here. But just as before, Meshroom didn't find the locations of all cameras correctly. You can see this little gap here. But this time the situation is different because this time I know the coordinates from which the pictures were taken and I can load them into Meshroom so Meshroom uses them as a starting point for the reconstruction. And if I do that, then all cameras are in the right place. I should probably mention that this feature of loading camera positions into Meshroom is not well documented. I had to go through the source code to figure out what format Meshroom expects and even then it didn't work at first because I think there's an error in the code. So I had to change the code and compile Meshroom on my computer. I'll raise a GitHub issue about it soon and we'll talk about it in a future video. So if we look at the resulting model, it looks good. I should have increased the exposure and the holes in the object are still not good enough. But you know, that's something we can fix by just taking more pictures. And now taking more pictures is easy. I just have to tell the machine and let it run again. For example, this is a reconstruction with many more photos and the result looks good, very good. You know, I don't think I would ever have taken that many pictures manually. <laughs> okay, so far we've only reconstructed this piece of wood, which apart from the holes is relatively easy to reconstruct because its surface has quite a distinct pattern. There are lots of features for the algorithm to hold on to, but there are many objects that are not as easy to reconstruct. For example, this thing holds the door of a piece of furniture, but a part of it broke off, so I want to 3D print a replacement. Of course, we could take a few pictures from all sides and use those as a template in a CAD program, which wouldn't be too difficult in this case, because it has a very regular shape, but let's try to create a 3D reconstruction of it. And the result that I got is this. That didn't really work. And that's because the surface of this object is so uniform and a bit reflective. There are whole patches that just look white. So there aren't many features for the algorithm to grab onto. So what we can do is to try and create features. For example, we can draw a random pattern onto this object. I made this one. And if we do the reconstruction now, the result looks like this. It's still not perfect, but it's much better than before. You can even see this little ridge that goes around here. Now, unfortunately, we can't draw a random pattern on every object that we may want to reconstruct. For example, the owner of this bunny wouldn't be happy if I drew on it. And trying to reconstruct the bunny without an artificial pattern gives this slightly terrifying result. And that's not surprising because this surface is extremely difficult to reconstruct. It's completely homogeneous and very reflective. But there's a method that I've read about called the projected light method, where you use a projector or something else to project a random pattern of light onto the object. And if we try to do that with our bunny, then we get this reconstruction. Apart from a bit of noise, this is really good. 
and we may be able to improve it further by using a finer random pattern and by moving the camera closer to the object. Now, this has just been a quick test where I only projected light on one side of the bunny. So the other side looks horrible. <laughs> but in a future video, we may try to improve on that. The only thing is that the pattern that we project onto the object must always be in the same place on the object. But I don't see a way of doing that with the turntable. No, I'd have to rotate the light in exactly the same way as the turntable. And that seems virtually impossible, or at least very, very difficult to calibrate. So since this projected light method is the main reason for why I'm doing this project, the machine that I built doesn't only work with the turntable, but it can also go around the object that we want to reconstruct. And here's how I took the photos of the projected bunny. The big disadvantage is of course that doing that requires a lot of space, but we do get a good result. Okay, I think that's enough for this video. Let me tell you about the plan for the next videos. The next three will be about building the machines you've seen here. So those are probably most interesting for those of you who like to build stuff. So the next video, the second in this mini series, will be a short video about building the hardware of the turntable. The one after that will be about building the hardware of the main machine. And the one after that, the fourth one, will be about, about software aspects. Then we can start doing some tests. And the first one will probably be about something specific to Meshroom, namely about using known positions and CC tags for correct scaling. And then we can take it from there. So if you have any ideas about what else I should test, then let me know in the comments. And thanks for watching and see you soon.